Hello everyone. My name is Muhammad Harris Rais. I am a PhD student at Security and Forensics Engineering Lab at VCU under Dr. Irfan Ahmed. My main area of research is security and forensics of additive manufacturing. And today I am presenting our forensic readiness framework for 3D printing process through a case study of Ultimaker 3 printer. In this project, Dr. Jiali from Bradley University is collaborating with us. Now, recently, a lot of functional components, or critical functional components, are being 3D printed, like engine, turbine, aeroplane components, uh, car rims, etc. Now, in case of any accident, these components will be subjected to forensic investigation. Now, as 3D print, printing or 3D printed objects comprises a cyber physical system, conventional IT forensics is not enough. Moreover, the 3D printers have limited logging capabilities. Therefore, there is a need for a forensic readiness framework that is capable to analyze the printing process and the printing object in the physical domain. Now I will briefly describe the components of a, of a 3D printer and the printing process. In this study, we are using the technique called fused uh, deposition modeling or FDM. And this Ultimaker 3 printer is an FDM printer. The main components include, this is the printing bed. It's a heated printed bed. It can move in Z axis up and down. And this is the print head that actually does the printing. It holds the nozzle. From the top of the nozzle, solid filament is injected inside, and it, it, there is a heating element, heating chamber that melts the nozzle, that, that filament, and it's in the molten form or in a paste form is extruded out of the tip. The printing starts when the, the bed is at the top, very near to the nozzle. Layer one is printed, then the bed goes a bit down, and second layer is printed, then the third layer, and so on. So this 3D printing is basically a layer by layer printing. The print head can move in X and Y direction through stepper motors. And you can see these are the stepper motors. So if we see uh, the freedom of movement axis, we have like X axis, Y axis, uh, Z axis, the printing bed, and the filament that it can be pushed or retracted. The 3D printing process starts with a design file that can be designed in any CAD software like AutoCAD. And then the design file is sent to STL editor software that converts the design into STL stereolithography format. This is composed of triangles that represent the outer structure of the object. As you can see, this is the triangle. It is represented by the vertices and the normal uh, facing out. And this STL file is then sent to a slicer software that converts it to G-code instructions. The ins G-code instructions can be like move instructions. These are instructions for the printer, like move from point A to B. This should be the speed. This should be the acceleration. This should be the temperature, etc. Then this G-code file is then sent to the printer hardware where the firmware executes the instructions sequentially to print the final object. As we know, this is a layer by layer printing. There is a unique phenomena in additive manufacturing that was not present in the previous subtractive manufacturing where we should have, we would have a block and we cut it from all sides and come up with a, uh, with the final object. But here we are printing layer by layer. So we have the leverage to decide how the internal layers would look like. And this structure is called infill patterns. The pattern and the density both are uh, flexible parameters that can be adjusted, like uh, the pattern can be dense or can be lighter, or can be a different pattern, like it's a gyroid or lines or triangles or honeycomb. So these patterns and the density of the patterns also dictate the mechanical properties of the object. Now we come over to the investigation questions. What the forensic team investigating an accident would be interested in? They would, first of all, they would be interested in the geometry of every layer. That's most obvious. 
then the layer thickness for each layer and the number of layers the object was printed. Like maybe an object, two objects look similar, but one was printed with less number of layers, but thicker layers can have different set of properties. Another important aspect that we discussed in the previous slide is the infill pattern and density. If we change the infill, definitely the strength of the material would change. And then the quantity of material on the per object basis, per layer basis, and even per section basis of each layer. Another important aspect is the timing profile. Timing profile is very important in additive manufacturing. Uh, one example is the orientation. Like for example, if, we, uh, if, if one part has to be printed before the other part, but we swap, swap it, we can uh, uh, reduce the mechanical strength or can have some impact on the properties. Then the last two are the temperature profiles, like what was the nozzle temperature during the printing? What was the bed temperature during the printing? Was it changed or was there any manipulation in it or not? So with these questions in mind, we devised a framework. The two main components of the framework are data logging and data analysis. And the, the process starts with independent sensors deployment. Why we deploy an independent sensors? Because if a system or a process is compromised, it can fake the feedback and to give a false illusion of normalcy. So we deployed independent sensors. The sensors are pretty ubiquitous and inexpensive and easy to deploy. So that was not a big issue. Uh, then we accumulate, acquired and accumulate the data through Arduino. In fact, the sensors that ever energized also with the, with the Arduino board. Now, after accumulating the data, we sent it to the forensic control unit where we split the process into uh, a sequence of 2D problems. And you might imagine that splitting is done in synchronization with the layer change. So actually, every layer we analyze in two dimensions, X and Y dimensions. After splitting, we uh, apply some estimation, synchronization, transformation functions to calculate the parameters of interest to the invest investigation team. And we do per layer multi-domain analysis. We analyze the problem in time domain and the space domain. And there are some obvious advantages that we'll discuss later. And then we come up with the presentation of the final results in a uh, uh, visualizable format. So for case study, we selected Ultimaker 3. It's a famous FDM printer. So for the sensors, as we discussed, like the kinetic and thermodynamics, kinetics related to movement, thermodynamics related to temperature are key processes in uh, 3D printing. So what all is included in kinetics, there are like four different axes of movement, like X axis, Y axis, Z axis, and the filament axis. So we deployed four different sensors for this. For thermodynamics, the nozzle temperature and the bed temperature. So there are like six different sensors that we deployed in, in, in our uh, case study. To track the movement, Initially, we uh, evaluated accelerometers and IMU sensors, but we found out them to be very sensitive to normal background noises, vibration noises within the printer and even in the environment like the printer table, etc. Then we switched to optical encoders. They, we found them pretty robust to the noises and even more accurate as well. We used rotary encoders for the x-axis, y-axis, and the filament axis. Like these are the rotary shafts, and we deployed these sensors on top of it. And for the bed movement, we deployed a linear encoder, optical encoder, uh, to uh, track the bed movement. What happens is that the sensor generates the pulses whenever there is a movement, and those pulses triggers intraproteins in Arduino. And we deploy some uh, direction detection uh, algorithms and then accumulate the pulses and finally convert those pulses into distance. For tracking the temperature, we used uh, 
thermistors for the bed temperature. It, it comes with a stick-on mechanism, so it was pretty easy to deploy. And thermistors works on the principle of change in resistance with the change in temperature. So we deploy a very uh, simple voltage divider circuit and converted that change in resistance into temperature through different functions. But this thermistor temperature range is less, like it's around 150 Celsius. That was pretty much fine for the Ultimaker printer bed. But for the nozzle, Ultimaker nozzle may go up to 350 Celsius. So we needed a K-type thermocouple here. Uh, it works on the principle of generating voltages when there is a temperature change. Uh, but the voltages are so weak that we had to deploy a pre-amplifier circuit as well, and then finally convert it to the temperatures. Now, when from Arduino, we send the data to the forensic control unit, where we deploy synchronization, interpolation, estimation, and some transformation functions. Uh, and then uh, we get a series of samples at 50 milliseconds where each sample is uh, defined by a set of attributes such as the location of the nozzle at the time of when the sample was created in XYZ thing, the speed of the nozzle, temperature of the nozzle, temperature of the bed, at that time, extrusion status and the filament length. So after time domain, we transform the data into space domain as well. So in Ultimaker 3, the printer bed is 200 millimeter by 200 millimeter, and we represented it by 2D array of 2000 pixel by 2000 pixel. So each pixel actually represents a square of 0.1 millimeter by 0.1 millimeter. So after transformation, each pixel represent, is also represented by a set of attributes pretty much like uh, the time of print, the nozzle temperature, the length of the filament consumed, speed of the nozzle extrusion status, whether there was some material available on that pixel or not. Uh, the printer, the bed temperature is not required because we just have one sensor and uh, to repeat the same value for all pixels uh, does not make a lot of sense. Now we discuss about the accuracy. So these are the camera images. We actually printed a rectangular prism. And these are the internal layers. We did not print deliberately the top layers to show the accuracy of how we see the, uh, how our system actually reproduces the results. So if you see here, this is five millimeter by five, uh, five centimeter by five centimeter rectangular prism, internal layers. And we, the, our like, uh, results are pretty much accurate. It is exactly five centimeter by five centimeter. Uh, in some iterations, we saw an error of up to 0.2 millimeters. So it's always less than one millimeter error. And if you see, uh, these are uh, for dimension, dimension for dimension, edge for edge, angle for angle, pixel for pixel. These are pretty much accurate representation. We deliberately changed one of these lines in one of the prints to see if this is detectable. And you can see in the, uh, in the results, it, this line is not a visible here. So uh, it, we were like confident about it, then we moved to the case study or a use case. So it, this is a hypothetical use case. We did not actually print it, we did not have a metal printer. So uh, this is a 3D printed rim of a car that got fractured during operation and prematurely and the uh, resulting in an accident and the rim got crushed. So uh, co uh, forensic analysis could not reveal because the it was terribly crushed, could not reveal any information about the failure. Then the forensic team evaluated the CAD file, STL file and G-code file and they found all of them to be accurate. And they saw the network traffic and they could trace the exact correct file was pushed uh, from the control PC to the printer. So what next? So luckily, uh, the printers were deployed with our framework and they revealed some interesting findings. So when they analyzed the logs from our framework, uh, there was some suspicious infill geometry found in few layers. And there were some temperature fluctuations was also uh, observed. 
So the forensic team came up with an idea of reprinting the same file, same design file in a controlled environment. And then they compared the logs of the uh, sample print with the suspected print. And the findings are as below, like uh, from, for 10 layers, like the print was around 225 layers. For 10 layers, the infill pattern geometry was modified and the nozzle temperature profile was also modified while other parameters were pretty much correct. Now here you can see, this is the sample that was printed and this is the rim under investigation. And you see, this is a space domain representation. In this portion, you can see that a couple of lines are missing. This infill pattern lines are deliberately missed out due to some attack. We also printed these infill lines uh, separately to give you an idea like in actual printing these lines are also missing then we evaluate the thermodynamic profile if you see here the benign print the maximum range and the minimum range for a particular layer they are within one celsius uh, we have observed a couple of celsius difference is also possible but in this case in the suspected rim you can see the temperature range is from 475 to 476, it's a difference of like 10, 11 Celsius. And that's also not random. It is very concentrated in one area. So now this creates a temperature gradient where uh, like uh, higher and lower temperatures create thermal stresses and that degrade the stress bearing capability of the object. In the time domain, you can see the benign object is like pretty much a straight line, but here, in the first quarter, there was uh, a dip, like the temperature was around 460, or like 10 Celsius down. Uh, to summarize, like we uh, prepared a forensic readiness framework using independent sensors, optical encoders for movement, and thermistor thermocouple for temperature measurement. We did per layer analysis. Uh, we did multi-domain analysis, and the accuracy was are like for a space domain, we found it to be sub millimeter accurate and the, it's less than one second accuracy for the time domain. Uh, thank you very much. If you have any questions, uh, please feel free.